what a great talk about some really cool ideas. Um, hopefully everyone can mull over that um, and think about drinking their own urine. And we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Charlie Payton. Yes, um, not Patton. Um, he's managing director at Seawater Greenhouse and Rooftop Greenhouse, which um, are both really interesting concepts taking, um, I guess, unorthodox resources or things that we wouldn't think of as, as uh, resources and using them to grow crops and to heat houses uh, using things that are already there. So he's designed and supervised construction of these seawater greenhouses in Abu Dhabi, Oman, and Australia. So I, desert areas where we're using seawater instead of fresh water. And um, I'm sure he can tell you much more about it than I can. Why don't you come on up and let's well, give him a big, big welcome. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Paul, for setting it up so well. Um, you must forgive the slightly cheesy title. Um, a climate recipe, um, and I'm going to talk about climate change, but the idea that if we can crack climate change and solve it, we also solve every other problem at the same time. <clears throat> um, there's a bewildering number of problems that we're facing, and what I want to suggest is that if we, if we simply produce more water and use it more wisely, we can solve all of the other problems at the same time. And in fact, it's not so much that we need, it's not so much that we need the water, but we need what the water can do. And what the water does best, which we use it for most, is photosynthesis. It's growing crops. But we don't necessarily need liquid water to do that. We can also do it with water vapor. Um, and we think of, this is a film of the world on a continuous loop. Um, it's showing photosynthesis, and we think of photosynthesis plant growth as a fairly static thing. You know, there are tropical areas where they grow, and there are desert areas where they don't grow. But in fact, you can see it's a very dynamic thing, and it's a very sensitive. It's very sensitive to the things that we do, because all of those desert areas you can see on, on the film would not be there were it not for mankind. Those deserts have all been created by humans. And indeed, where you see deserts, typically in North Africa, in the Horn of Africa, you also get a lot of conflict, and which is to do with um, not so much the water, but it's growing food. And if you can't grow food, then you get angry, and you've got nothing else to do. The, in, incidentally, the, the Arab Spring was triggered by the price of wheat doubling in 2008, but the wages didn't go up at the same time. So all across North Africa, wheat had been subsidized and they had to take the subsidies away and that was one of the, the, the primary trigger for the, for the Arab Spring. There's a very interesting study that's come out of NASA that suggests that if we were to re-vegetate both the Sahara and the outback in Australia, the amount of CO2 that would be mopped up in the process would be equal to all of the CO2 that we're currently emitting. Now, there are many critics of the scheme which argue that it would just be too expensive and too energy intensive to do it. But I want to argue here that it may actually be possible to do it at almost zero cost. And it's to do with greenhouses. Everybody's got an idea of a greenhouse. They look something like this. Um, we have greenhouses because we can grow very intense, very high yields of crops. And we can grow crops out of season in conditions where we wouldn't otherwise. Most of us think of greenhouses as hothouses. So we have greenhouses in Europe and in Holland, where these are from, where for most of the year, we actually have to heat the greenhouse. And we have to trap the heat. And we often use artificial light to optimize the crop. But there's another type of greenhouse that's cropped up um, over the last 30 years. This is a, a satellite photograph of the south of Spain in Almeria, where there's some 40,000 hectares of greenhouses. These weren't designed, it was just somebody had the idea of covering his field in polythin and being able to grow tomatoes in the winter. And the idea proved so successful that everybody copied him and the, whole, the, the entire region became covered in plastic, which of course created its own problems. But um, but it, as you can see here, it grew from absolutely nothing from being a desert in, in the uh, mid-70s to being completely covered in plastic. 
This is the greenhouse that I'm involved in. It's, it doesn't look like a conventional greenhouse or an Almeria greenhouse. And you could, the front wall there is actually covered in cardboard. And the cardboard is a very simple structure that we pour seawater down so that, that as the air goes through the, sea, the, the cardboard, water evaporates. And because the water evaporates, it cools the air. And in cooling the air, it also raises the humidity. So just those two things reduce the amount of water we need to grow crops by an order of magnitude. And it also enables us to grow crops that would not be possible to grow otherwise in, the, in those conditions. Uh, this, is, this is the cardboard structure. And the, and the main photograph shows a piece of cardboard that's seven years old. And you can see it's beginning to go slightly whitish. And that's because the calcium in seawater precipitates out and forms a kind of lime scale on the cardboard, gradually turning it into a solid, into a solid rock. So the main lesson that we learned from this pilot was that it wasn't so much a question of making more water, it's a question of growing better crops using less water through the process of humidification. You've probably all seen these sort of graphs. You can see the, uh, at the very bottom there we have um, vegetables and the number there says you need 320 liters of water to grow one kilo of vegetables. But in fact, that number can be anything. It can be anything from five to a thousand, depending on the conditions, because the, the amount of water that the crop transpires depends entirely on its temperature, the humidity, and the wind speed. And if you can moderate the, the, the humidity by raising it, and if you can reduce the, temp the, um, reduce the temperature, then you get a, a significant increase in photosynthesis. Going back to Africa, um, something like 58% of the continent is classified as desert, along with, of course, the, um, the, the Middle East region. And very much of that desert formerly wasn't, in fact, desert, but in, in fact it was covered in vegetation. So there's, there is, there's no shortage of land to be able to grow more food and to create more, more photosynthetic activity. I'm just going to show a very short history of the world over the last 10,000 years in two slides. Uh, in, in most places, this could be India, this could be California, this could be Australia, you have vegetation, and the vegetation is pumping, air, pumping water vapor into the air. You've also got water vapor coming from the sea to the land, and together they increase the humidity as the air goes up, pushed up over the mountain where uh, as, it, as, as the air is pushed up, it cools down and causes rain. So most of the rainfall we get comes from mountains and then runs back from the mountain towards the sea. And you, so you have the big cycle of water from the land to the sea and the smaller cycle of water from the land to the land. But in fact, most of our rainfall, something like 80% of it, is derived from plants. What humanity's done over the last 10,000 years is reduce the amount of vegetation significantly. And this has happened through the development of cities, of course, and building car parks and roads, and, and also through overgrazing and deforestation. And so this is a very simple explanation of why uh, deforestation leads to reduced rainfall and why rainfall tends to happen in the greatest amounts where there is vegetation. If we reverse that situation by evaporating very large volumes of water, if you can imagine the 40,000 hectares of greenhouses in Almeria, if they were using the seawater greenhouse process, we would be putting something like 3 million tons of water into the atmosphere every day, pure water from, from seawater. And what happens when we're short of water in many places is we turn to irrigation. And irrigation is really like using the ground as a bank account for water, but nobody actually knows how much water there is in the ground. They just pump it out. Now, what happens as you pump water out, then um, the water table will drop, assuming you're pumping water at a rate that is greater than it's coming in. So the water table drops, and as the water table drops, the water there is likely to be become more salty because it is closer to sea level or because it has been in contact with rock. 
um, for a very long time. When you pump those salts onto the ground and um, to, to irrigate plants, then the, the salts themselves don't evaporate. The plants transpire only pure water, and the salts gradually build up and poison the ground. And over the last few decades, we've lost as much land to salinization as has been brought into production through irrigation. This is an example of, uh, of over-abstraction. These center pivot irrigation devices were set up in Saudi Arabia just 30 years ago. And now the, the entire operation has been abandoned because within, within a decade, they, they used up all their fossil water. This is a greenhouse we built in Oman, and you can see the, the photograph on, on the right shows a lot of vegetation around the greenhouse. That appeared by itself. We didn't plant anything. We didn't irrigate anything. It's just that by evaporating large volumes of water, we're, we're changing the, the, the microclimate and, we're, um, and increasing the likelihood of dew and reducing the amount of evaporation and transpiration. So this is, this is just weedy sort of... Um, uh, grassy vegetation that's just, just appeared by itself. And inside we're growing intensive um, cucumber crops. And this is, this is in a place where um, the summer temperatures are routinely 45 degrees in the day. Um, and in fact, all through the summer, the temperature never goes below 30 degrees. But it's still possible to grow very intensive um, high-value crops like tomatoes and cucumbers. Another greenhouse in Australia, this is right on the edge of the outback, um, in a place where there is no agriculture. And again, using um, quite sophisticated hydroponics setup, um, we're growing uh, a, a intensive um, production of tomatoes. And in this case, we're getting uh, 70 kilos of tomatoes a square meter crop, which equates to 700 tons per hectare. And in a place we're about to start working in Somalia, the average yield uh, for, that farmers get in Somalia is half a ton a hectare, and only 1% of the land is actually used for agriculture because it's so arid. This is what it looks like, and I don't know if you can see it. There's a, there's a tiny little white square. That represents 40,000 hectares, so that if we dropped in the example I showed you for Al Maria, which I'm not suggesting is a very good idea, but, but you can see that it's just, it's just a dot in the ocean. So the, the, the potential there is fantastic. And the approach we're going for is to, um, by studying the climate and the conditions in very great detail, especially looking at the wind and the pattern of the prevailing wind, how can we do, make the whole thing be driven entirely by sunlight and wind directly? In other words, not having to use... Um, power for fans. Um, and at the same time, how can we integrate it with uh, a more traditional pastoral method of agriculture, which is better understood in those kind of conditions? Using the greenhouse as a water generator and a generator of cool, humid air to enable uh, a, a much bigger area beyond the greenhouse itself to be cultivated with more conventional type crops. And again, just using very simple shade net covered structures that are also ventilated and cooled at the same time by the seawater. One of the byproducts of the process is salt. Um, this might look like the periodic table, but in fact, it's showing the uh, relative proportions of minerals in seawater. So we think of seawater as being salty, and yes, sodium chloride is the main salt in seawater. But there's also a lot of other things, and in fact, everything we need to grow the crops, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and all the trace elements are also in seawater. And we can use these so long as we can separate the salt, the sodium chloride, from the seawater itself. So another vision of how the thing might look in arid regions here, using, um, using the greenhouse as a solar-powered desalination and cooling system, uh, with orchards in between, so we, we, we create a series of, of windbreaks to protect each, each subsequent downwind operation. And I'd just like you to leave you with one conclusion, um, and I don't know how you can interpret that, but it's the closest we can get. Thank you.